The fossil record is one of the greatest pieces of evidence that we have in support of evolutionary theory. Through the fossil record, we're able to see how species have changed over the billions of years that life has existed on the planet Earth. In this video, we'll talk about the fossil record, we'll talk about the types of things that we see in the fossil record, and we'll even talk about how fossils form in the first place. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. The fossil record is one of the greatest bodies of evidence that we have in support of modern evolutionary theory. By examining fossils, we can see how life has changed from very simple microbial mats several billion years ago to the wonderful complex array of highly complex life forms that we see on the planet Earth today. The oldest confirmed fossils are somewhere between 3.5 and, and 3.7 billion years old. Uh, the Strelly Pool Formation in Australia has recently been dated to about 3.45 billion years old, although there have been some fossils found off the coast of Greenland that may be older still at about 3.7 billion years old. Now, what we see in the earliest fossils that we find was life most closely resembles prokaryotic life in, on today's planet. Very small, very simple, and most likely lived at the bottom of the ocean in what are referred to as microbial mats. Now, when you look at fossils like this, um, it can be kind of hard to um, tell how one might be able to know whether this is biological in nature or just some strangely colored rock. And that's a fair point. So how, how do we know then um, that these rocks are examples of rocks from biological origin or fossils versus rocks from geologic origin or not from, living, not from life in the first place? Uh, well, we're going to go back to another isotope of carbon. So in a previous video, we talked about carbon-14. Uh, so C14 is a heavy version of carbon with two extra neutrons um, that is actually radioactive. Um, it represents one in every one trillion carbon atoms that are in the atmosphere. Uh, on the other hand, carbon-13 is a non-radioactive form that doesn't decay, so it doesn't fall apart over time like C14 does. It's not radioactive. Uh, carbon-13 is only slightly heavier than carbon-12, um, and it represents one out of 100 uh, carbon atoms in the atmosphere. So how does that help us? Well, uh, what's interesting is photosynthetic organisms preferentially incorporate carbon-12 over carbon-13 uh, into their photosynthetic products. And as a result, that C13 to C12 ratio is lower in living things or things of biological origin than it is in the atmosphere. So if we look at things that we suspect might be fossils of microbial mats, even if they're billions of years old, if we look at the C13 to C12 ratio and it's, uh, it looks like it's more biological in terms of that ratio as opposed to um, non-biological, in other words, it's lower, um, then it's fairly safe to say that those rocks are of biological origin as opposed to being of geological origin and likely represent a fossil of a once living thing as opposed to just a weirdly colored rock or a small inclusion in the rock. And that's how a lot of this research has been done. And the results seem to indicate that um, life existed on this planet in at least somewhat complex form as early as 3.7 billion years ago. Uh, some other estimates indicate that if life was this complex at that stage, that life may have, been, may have been around for over 4 billion years, uh, but some of that is just conjecture at this point as we await more data um, uh, from, from earlier uh, samples of life on the planet Earth. Now, in order to understand uh, the fossil record, first, I think we need to understand how fossils form in the first place, right? So uh, as we know, not everything is going to fossilize. In fact, uh, fossilization is going to require some very specific steps that for the most part, aren't met. So for example, uh, if something's going to become a fossil, it, it has to either, essentially, it can't be consumed or it can't decompose. And almost everything on this planet that dies is going to be um, either eaten as food or decomposed to the activity of decomposers. So how do some things escape that fate? Uh, well, through a rare set of circumstances. Essentially, what has to happen is something has to die um, and then rapidly be covered by sediment-filled water and sort of be buried and then filled up with that sediment. So as a result, certain organisms are actually more fossilizable than others. So for example, soft-bodied things don't fossilize that well. The fossil record of um, extinct jellyfish species and extinct worm species is essentially non-existent uh, because soft-bodied things just degrade very rapidly after death and just aren't around 
to fossilize. So hard bodied things tend to fossilize way better. Things with internal skeletons like dinosaurs or exoskeletons uh, like crabs and, and trilobites, those things tend to fossilize really well because of their hard parts. Um, the other thing that needs to happen, is, the other thing we also know is things that live in or near water tend to fossilize better. Lots of examples of fossilized seashells, not a lot of examples of fossilized chimpanzees because they tend not to die, fall into a creek, and rapidly be covered by sediment-filled water. So um, fossilization is exceedingly rare. Nevertheless, we have confirmed fossils of over 250,000 different species, both uh, different species, both living and extinct. So living would be extant, um, and then extinct is obviously extinct. Um, now that represents only about 0.1% to 1% of all species that have ever lived on the planet. It depends on which estimate of the number of species you use. But the bottom line is the overwhelmingly overwhelming majority of species are most likely lost and gone forever. We'll never actually know what they looked like or or what they existed like. But for those that we do, um, we have a fairly, uh, a fairly in-depth fossil record of, the the, uh, of how these species have changed over time. And the fossils that we do have provide us with a wealth of information about the evolution of species and entire groups of species uh, through the existence of transition fossils, for example. So there are different ways in which fossilization can occur or different types of fossils that we find. Um, one of the first steps is, is usually something called permineralization. So essentially what happens is the thing that dies uh, sinks into sediment-filled water, and that sediment rapidly uh, both covers it and protects it from decomposition as well as being consumed. Um, and then it also fills it as well. And then over time, what can happen is the organic material that was part of that particular organism eventually goes away, and then you're left uh, oftentimes with what's called uh, a, a mold or uh, alternatively an endocast. So a mold uh, is what happens when you see the external structures, you see the imprint of that particular specimen. So for example, seashells uh, quite often leave molds where you can see, uh, you can't see the actual seashell, but you can see what it looked like because it left like this concrete impression in the uh in the in the rock okay in the sedimentary rock uh, other times you get these endocasts or internal molds uh, this is what happens when sediment fills up a sample or fills up a, a, a species and then the organic material kind of goes away and what you're left with is what the impression looks like from the inside um, skull endocasts are a great example you can often see uh, like the brain wrinkles and the complexity of the neuronal paths and stuff, uh, which can provide us with uh, a wealth of interesting information about like what brain structures or internal organs might have looked like and these, what the insides of these structures of these organisms actually looked like at the time in which they lived. Another thing that can happen is something called replacement and recrystallization. So essentially the organic minerals and organic materials that are found inside that particular uh, specimen are replaced with new minerals and when this happens you can actually get some of the most elegant and elaborate um, fossil uh, recreations because essentially everything that's in that organism is just replaced with different minerals and hardens in the form of rock and you get these beautiful ornate uh, very detailed fossils when events like this actually happen. The next two types of fossils often occur together, which is why they're called adpression. So they're compression and impression fossils. So compression happens when essentially the organic material is squeezed so hard against um, the rocks that you end up getting essentially like a film. It almost looks like a film negative of the organism. And in, in some cases, you actually find pigment. So for example, some of the uh, early bird species, they can find, they've actually found um, different pigment molecules. We know what color the feathers actually were on some of these bird species. And then on the other side of the rock, you get what was called the impression fossil. So you get the, the film uh, uh, the, from the compression, and then the other side, you get the impression, which is sort of the physical shape, the imprint uh, of the structure that was originally compressed. Like I said, quite often they come together. So when you crack the rock open, you get uh, the the impression or the compression on one side and the impression on the other, hence the term adpression fossils. Another fossil yielding process is known as uh, carbonization or coalification. Uh, this is kind of neat. What ends up happening is when these uh, when these species are, are buried or uh, as the fossils are forming, essentially everything but the carbon goes away and you end up what's left with, with, with compressed carbon, which is coal, right? So you end up with these dark sort of like coal substances that literally are in the shape of the original organism which is kind of neat, and that's why it's called coalification, because you're just looking at these dark, 
uh, charcoal outlines of what the species used to look like. And that's because all the coal has just been compressed together to form uh, a carbon structure that resembles uh, the original specimen. Uh, the last type of fossil that we'll talk about, and by no means is this is an exhaustive list, it's called bioimmuration. So bioimmuration quite often happens to sessile organisms. And sometimes what will happen is um, something will die and then land on something sessile or non-moving, like a sponge or uh, something like that. But what's neat is that um, if the thing that lands on top of the non-moving thing is hard, but the thing underneath it is actually soft, the hard body substance can actually help to make sure that that soft bodied thing, which normally wouldn't have likely become a fossil, actually does become fossilized because it's protected from degradation and being eaten by the hard body thing that died on top of it. And so sometimes you get like these two fossils that are all like together, but they're two totally different species. And it's just the sheer fault of one thing dying and landing on top of the other thing. And then as one becomes a fossil, it preserves the other thing as a fossil at the same time. This is called bioimmuration, which is all yields also some pretty cool information because in many ways, it's, it's in many cases, it's the only way we actually have evidence of some of these soft body things existing because something hard died on top of it and became a fossil through this unlikely series of events. So as you can see, the steps leading to fossilization are pretty rare, which is why we don't have fossils of everything. You know, we don't have fossils of every species that ever lived, but nevertheless, we do have lots of different fossils and we have uh, many different fossils that tell us a very interesting story about how life has evolved over geologic time. So what I wanna talk about now is sort of what the fossil record tells us, talk about some of the high points. So uh, one of the things that we're able to do um, is organized geologic time based on the rock strata. And what's ended up happening is we divide geologic time into larger and then smaller units. So for example, we start with eons and then we uh, break those eons down into eras and then those eras are broken down into periods. So in, in those periods are typically named after the rock strata that exists within them. So for example, we talked about Permian strata or Devonian rocks and so on and so forth. Well, they're now known as the Permian period and the Devonian period and so on and so forth. Thanks to the relative dating, we know the relative order in which these rock layers were laid down. So we know which geologic periods occurred before and which occurred after certain periods. And we also, thanks to the advent of absolute dating techniques, know approximately how long ago these particular geologic periods took place. This has helped us to not only order the fossil record, but it's also helped us to understand about how long ago certain events took place. So as I mentioned, the fossil record indicates that life on Earth has been around for at least 3.5 and maybe as long as 3.7 billion years uh, based on the data that we've collected. Now, the overwhelming majority of Earth's history, about 87% of it, stretching from essentially the beginning of life on Earth all the way up to uh, actually the formation of the earth itself 4.6 billion or so years ago right up until about 550 million years ago is collectively known as the pre-cambrian and because you'll see in a little bit the cambrian is where we first have evidence of modern multicellular species but everything in the pre-cambrian um, for the most part and we'll talk about an exception in just a minute was single-celled organisms and up until about up until about 1.4 to to 1.6 billion years ago, everything was strictly prokaryotic. So single celled prokaryotic organisms. So for the first two billion years or so that life existed on the planet, we were looking at things that lived in microbial mats at the bottom of the ocean that would have most likely resembled closely um, the bacteria and the archaea that we see on the planet today. I can't, we have no way of knowing that they exactly look like that, but they would probably be most similar to those things. So the earliest forms of life would have lived at the bottom of the ocean in these microbial mats, um, and they would have either made their energy through photosynthesis or getting it from geothermal thermal vents, uh, which were really the only two sources of energy available to them. Um, what's particularly interesting is early forms of photosynthesis were not likely oxygen producing. Uh, it's called anoxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, the reason we know this is we know life existed around 3.5 to 3.7 billion years ago, but there really isn't strong evidence for a significant amount of oxygen being in the Earth's atmosphere until somewhere between 3.2 and 2.6 billion years ago. Uh, and that's when modern photosynthesis likely evolved. And to be clear, as far as we know, photosynthesis has only evolved a single time on the planet Earth. Um, and that would give rise to um, a group of bacteria known as the cyanobacteria, which are sometimes referred to blue-green algae. They're not algae. Algae technically are uh, eukaryotes. 
uh, and uh, blue-green algae or cyanobacteria are prokaryotes. Um, and in fact, we wouldn't really see eukaryotic life up here in the fossil record until somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6 billion years ago. Between 1.2 and 1.4 billion years ago, we see the first evidence of multicellular species being to form or colonial eukaryotes uh, starting to exist. It's hard to tell the difference at that point. We also see evidence of sexual reproduction beginning to, involve, to evolve. Um, and, and that's when we first start to see um, the possibility that multicellular life is, and sexual reproduction are going to begin to dominate certain aspects of life on the planet Earth. Now, all of a sudden, somewhere around the Ediacaran period, which is the last period within the Precambrian, somewhere around 600 to 550 million years ago, we start to see the appearance of complex multicellular life in the fossil record. Now, these things don't really look anything like modern day species for the most part. They're collectively referred to as the Ediacaran biota. They're named after the Ediacaran period in which they're found. They are toroidal shaped. Uh, they can often look like bags. Um, they could look like, um, you know, very strangely shaped organisms. And again, not really like anything uh, that we see in the planet for the most part. And there's a lot of question about what they represent in terms of the tree of life. So uh, because most of these things don't really look like anything we see nowadays, um, most of the Ediac or biota and most of what we think about them um, are sort of dead end branches on the, on the uh, sort of tree of life for the most part when it comes to um, when it comes to the evolution of multicellular species. It does appear that life is becoming more complex at this point and there's some experimentation happening. And again, the appearance of these sort of evolutionarily experimental body structures may likely have been the result quite simply of the first appearance of complexity in sort of ecological niches that are open, right? So most of the stuff is living at the bottom of the sea. And these might have been the first types of organisms that can actually live off of these things at the bottom of the sea instead of relying for the most part on either consuming, you know, free nutrients from the environment. And we might actually have seen something that established maybe some primitive predator prey relationships. Um, now, some more Ediacaran biota have been discovered um, and the controversy continues as to what these groups um, represent because there are there do seem to be some like Virginia, for example, that do uh, sort of resemble um, modern day species, um, which means that it's possible and very likely that the at least the head groups of many modern animal phyla actually existed at this time. They just really weren't found in the fossil record for the most part. And to be fair, you know, we're still finding fossils and we refer to as the Ediacaran biota as opposed to being animals because we can't really establish whether these represent true animals or not. Again, that's why the Ediacaran biota are so sort of controversial and, and hotly debated what they actually represent. But the bottom line is that by the time we get to the last period of the Precambrian, we are already seeing life reaching this sort of complex stage where we have now have multicellular um, complex organisms that are no longer living and just tied to the sea floor. They're allowed to sort of move about. The Precambrian ends 541 million years ago at the beginning of the Cambrian period. And something very interesting happens in the fossil record. It's something referred to as the Cambrian explosion. So what we see in the Cambrian strata, um, almost all of a sudden in evolutionary terms is we see the existence of almost every modern animal phyla begin to appear in the fossil record where there really wasn't a ton of evidence beforehand. Um, a lot of this uh, stems from the fact that many of these Cambrian um, fossils were originally identified from a single rock formation in Western Canada. Um, and you know it's one of those things where uh, people have hotly debated what the Cambrian explosion actually represents. Um, some people have actually used the Cambrian explosion to express anti-evolutionary ideas. Uh, the idea that all of a sudden you get all of the modern animal phyla or the majority of them appearing where they didn't appear in the fossil record. We start to see, you know, highly advanced body forms of things like trilobites. We start to see the first, uh, the, the first existence of things like vertebrates. We see mollusks, we see echinoderms and all of these different groups of species where we really don't have a ton of evidence for them in the fossil record before the Cambrian. But the question then becomes, was the Cambrian explosion really an explosion in the first place? And what does it really represent? 
Um, and there's been a lot of, of argument in the biological community about this. More evidence has come to light. We're starting to have access to things like molecular clocks and so on and so forth uh, that describe uh, what we understand about the Cambrian explosion. It sort of revised what it tells us. First and foremost, um, when we look back at the Ediacaran uh, biota, which we didn't have a ton of information about when you know the Cambrian explosion was first coined, the Cambrian explosion, we start to see that multicellular life actually existed well before the Cambrian. Now, to be fair, a lot of the Ediacaran biota don't look like modern day species, but we do see certain species like Spurginia, for example, that look very, very close to a modern day arthropod. Um, and we do see other examples of species that very well could be early ancestors of more modern groups like mollusks, mollusks and vertebrates and so on and so forth. So it's also possible that these species were there, but again, the fossilization just didn't take place. So why wouldn't the fossilization take place? Well, first off, these particular species may have just been a minority uh, in the particular environment. The Ediacaran biota may have been better adapted and may have been the dominant species. And as you know, fossilization really isn't that common of an event. So if you're looking at the minority groups of species and even a smaller number of those are likely to fossilize, well, then it's gonna be hard to find fossils of these things, even if they did exist in some abundance. The fact that we see an end to the Ediacaran biota as we transition from the Ediacaran into the Cambrian indicates that there may have also been a mass extinction. And when we see a mass extinctions uh, throughout geologic time, and there are five of them that we have denoted, this one is not one of them, if it did exist, um, a lot of species that are very commonly found in the fossil record go away, and then all of a sudden we start to find new fossils of the species that survived. Species that were originally minority species that we saw very little of now may begin to dominate the beginning of the next period because they're what survived the mass extinction event. And it's possible that that's what we're seeing here at the end of the Ediacaran, although we don't have proof that there was a mass extinction event that did occur, although it, there is some evidence that suggests that it may have. The other thing that we noticed is the oceans um, all of a sudden had a lot more calcium in it uh, towards the end of the Ediacaran. Why is this important? Well, calcium is what's widely used by hard body organisms to form endo or exoskeletons. So your bones um, are calcium dense. So are the exoskeletons of things like arthropods and uh, mollusks. They involve a lot of calcium. So what may have allowed for is harder bodied organisms to begin to form. Things began to form shells and exoskeletons. That makes them actually more fossilizable. Um, they're more likely to fossilize because now they're hard-bodied species as opposed to soft-bodied species. And as we described before, soft-bodied things tend not to fossilize very well. Hard-bodied things do. So it may likely be an artifact. We're just looking at the fact that things are better able to fossilize and now we can see them where we previously could not. So if they were around in the Ediacaran, were they around before then? Where did, they all, where did these modern species come from that we find in the Cambrian? Well, if we look at the molecular evidence, it's actually quite striking. We talked about in a previous uh, video about molecular clocks. When we run the molecular clock data and we look at some of the earliest known species, uh, some of the first ones um, that we see are the sponges. So, uh, and, and then we also see things like medarians. And then eventually we get what we call uh, bilaterals, bilaterally symmetrical species like us. Um, we can see that the divergence uh, data seems to indicate that the divergence of these three groups actually occurred way back in the cryogenian. And the cryogenian uh, was also known as snowball earth because the earth was essentially one giant snowball at that point. It was very cold back then. Um, we, we see, for example, that that's about when these species diverge according to the molecular data, which suggests that um, the progenitors of modern day species were actually around um, over 700, 750 million years ago. So well before the Cambrian. The bottom line is this, is the Cambrian explosion appears to be explosion when you look at the Burgess Shale, uh, where the majority of these species were originally identified. And to be fair, the Burgess Shale is one of the single greatest treasure troves of species diversity ever dis discovered in, in the entire world. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But when we look at the molecular data, we look at things like the Ediacaran biota and other pieces of fossil evidence, it really does seem to be that the explosion uh, the Cambrian explosion was likely an artifact of just how many things fossilized there. And if we didn't have the Burgess Shale, we'd still have evidence of species in the Cambrian, but it wouldn't be quite as striking. So, um, you know, the Cambrian explosion was an explosion. I don't know. It's still open for debate. But the bottom line is this. In no way does what we find in the Cambrian, uh, Cambrian rock layer anything that should challenge 
our understanding of evolutionary theory. If anything, it reinforces what we know about evolutionary theory and the diversity of species. We also know that at times, um, species can evolve fairly rapidly. One other potential explanation that's been offered is something known as the complexity threshold. One of the things we know about um, about complex systems is sometimes um, systems hit this critical threshold where um, increased complexity is now allowed. Uh, so for example, one of the things we see in early metazoans, the first true animals, is the existence of these genes called Hox genes. And we talked about these in a previous video. Hox genes are important for spatial temporal planning of, of, of development. They tell genes when to be on and where to be on in a body. Well, we first start to see Hox genes really appear in sponges and medarians, but we start to see a rapid um, gene multiplication of these Hox genes. And what we see is there's actually a pretty strong correlation between the number of Hox genes you have and the com relative complexity of your structure with vertebrates, for example, having significantly more than sponges and jellyfish, medarians. Um, so it's possible that once these genes evolved and some gene duplication events happen, all of a sudden life kind of hit this complexity threshold and all of a sudden, all new body plans were available that were never previously available before. And again, you have that sort of adaptive radiation into these niches. This is something that, again, we commonly see after a mass extinction event where you have all these open niches and the things that the, the few number of species that do survive um, then go on to radiate into and fill the gaps that were that were left open. Uh, by the species that died and went extinct during the mass extinction. So again, we could be looking at what we see, what we've seen five other times in the G, in the fossil record play out just at the beginning of the Cambrian period as the Ediacaran came to an end. So as we go through geologic time, the Cambrian is followed by a period known as the Ordovician period. Uh, the Ordovician period actually uh, there was a pretty important event that happened then. Um, during the Ordovician period, we see uh, evidence that uh, life finally came to land. So up until this point, uh, all of life existed in the ocean. Uh, there is evidence um, that at the end of the Ordovician and by the uh, beginning of the subsequent period known as the Silurian period, um, plants and then arthropods made their way onto land. Uh, during the Silurian period, we have firm evidence of well-adapted terrestrial plant species, things like bryophytes and mosses. So we're not talking about like full-on trees at this point, but we do see that there is plant life on land. We also start to see the appearance of arthropods, so bugs, things like uh, uh, millipedes, uh, began to uh, inhabit the earth. So for the first time, we have species moving out of the ocean onto terrestrial biomes, and you begin to inhabit there. Uh, another very important uh, movement to land happened in the middle of the Devonian period. Uh, the Devonian period um, you know, was also, is known as the age of fish, uh, and that's because the ocean was just teeming with, with uh, aquatic life at this point. But it's at this point that we actually see the appearance of the first tetrapods. So vertebrates finally make it to land at this point. Um, and we can see that as we go through the Devonian, um, we start to see by the end of that period, the first true amphibians. Uh, as we go through the Carboniferous period, which follows, we start to see the appearance of the first reptiles. And then uh, eventually as we proceed forward into the Triassic, we start to see mammals, and in the Jurassic, we start to see birds. So all of these things appear in the fossil record in a very stereotypical pattern as we begin to be see, see life diversify and begin to inhabit Earth. In a subsequent video, we'll talk about biogeography and how that may have influenced the evolution of species and what biogeography tells us about the distribution of species and how the Earth used to look and what it looks like today and how that's influenced species uh, on this planet. The other thing that we can see from the fossil record is evidence of five major mass extinction events. So mass extinction events are characterized as um, events in which uh, the biodiversity of the planet drops significantly. And usually it's somewhere between 75% or greater of the species on the planet now begin to go extinct according to the fossil record. As I said, we have evidence of five major mass extinction events. One of them occurred at the end of the Ordovician as it transitioned in the Silurian. Uh, the Devonian period ended in a mass extinction event as did the Triassic, the Permian, and the Cretaceous all ended in a mass extinction event. The one of the Permian was by far and away the most extensive or, or, or uh, almost 97% of life on the planet went extinct. It's known as the Great Dying. It's the closest life ever came to being completely extinguished uh, since, uh, since life appeared on the planet Earth as far as we know. One of the things that we see at the end of these mass extinctions is that there are going to be surviving species. Uh, and that these ecological niches that are now open as a result of the death uh, and extinction of several different 
predominant species um, now becomes uh, a space where uh, the surviving species can begin to radiate and diversify into. Life always recovers eventually. Sometimes it takes a few hundred thousand years. Sometimes, like at the end of the Permian, it takes a few million years to begin to fill these gaps. Taken together, the fossil record provides us with a treasure trove of information about the evolution of species. One of the things that's perhaps the most striking thing about the fossil record is how entirely consistent it is. When we look at the fossil record, we never find fossils out of the wrong day order. So for example, we don't find ancestral humans before we see the appearance of the first tetrapods. We don't see the first tetrapods in, in the record until we see evidence of the first vertebrates. We never find amphibians uh, running around in the Precambrian when we know life was all prokaryotic. The point being is that the fossil record is always consistent. Uh, but perhaps uh, even more striking than that is the fact that the fossil record also is predictive. If we understand what the fossil record is telling us, we can also begin to predict where in the fossil record we should find things that we don't have evidence of yet. One of the greatest examples of this is the discovery of what's known as the fishapod, Tiktaalik rosy. One of the things that have been known is that sometime during the Devonian period, vertebrates move to land. They are descendants of species known as lobe-finned fish. And we know this because of the uh, homologous traits that we find, the homologous structures that we find in lobe-finned fish and that we find in all tetrapods. But there was a gap, and the gap existed somewhere between 400 and 360 million years ago. And this is where we should be finding transition species. Uh, and what we know, what, what was in the fossil record up until the, or up until the mid 90s, or actually the early 2000s, was that 400 million years ago, all vertebrates are in the water. There are no terrestrial vertebrates. And by the time you get to 360 million years ago at the end of the Devonian, you have fossil evidence of species that are highly adapted for land. But based on evolutionary theory, it would tell you that there needs to be a transition. You can't just go from entirely fish to entirely amphibian. There's got to be something in the middle. There had to be species that evolved from point A to point C. There has to be a point B, right? That's how evolution works. Well, this particular question was actually, this particular gap was actually filled by the research of three scientists. In the mid-90s, Edward Dashler, Neil Shubin, and Ferris Jenkins decided to set out to figure out whether there was a way to find evidence of these transition species. And using the predictive power of evolutionary theory, they said, well, at 400 million years ago, all vertebrates are fish. And 360 million years ago, we have both fish and amphibians. What we need to do are, is find rock layers that are exposed from about 375 million years ago. And in that little gap, we should find evidence of transition species. And they even narrowed it down even further and said we should probably be looking for exposed riverbeds or creek beds because it would logically speak that a transition species wouldn't be living in the middle of dry land, nor would they be found out in the deep ocean. They would be in some place that's sort of intermediate, right? They'd be in freshwater sources like rivers and creeks. They were able to find a place up in northern Canada called Ellesmere Island. Now, Ellesmere Island is well within uh, the Arctic Circle, which means the ability to do research up there is limited to a very small time window each year. So each year for four consecutive years, they went up there and spent a few weeks up in the Arctic Circle searching for these rocks. Now, the problem was is they were running out of funding, and on their fourth and what was likely their final trip, up to Ellesmere Island, they actually found the fossil of a species now known as Tiktaalik rosy. And when you reconstruct Tiktaalik rosy from her fossils, what you will see very clearly is Tiktaalik rosy has all of the hallmarks of an intermediate species. The tail and the flippers are those of lobe-finned fish. You can see it's a vertically oriented tail like a fish, not, not a horizontally oriented one like we find in most tetrapods. We look, we look and we see that the, the uh, fins have been reinforced to allow her to possibly stand upright when uh, for periods of time to either wander out on land or at least peer out of the water. But perhaps the most striking aspect of Tiktaalik Rosie's anatomy is the fact that it has a neck and that it has eyes that are oriented on the top of the head. First and foremost, fish don't have necks. They don't have heads. Their bodies are contiguous with each other. On the other hand, their eyes are always located on the sides of their head. But when we look at Tiktaalik rosy, Tiktaalik rosy has eyes oriented at the top of the skull, which tells us that this is an organism that spent a fair amount of time looking out of the water. 
you only look out of the water if there's something to be gained by it, whether you're wandering out there to go find food or to escape. So why might Tiktaalik Rosie have existed the way it did? Well, this is the age of fish, and the, and the oceans were filled with terrifying giant species of sharks and other types of things. What's safety? Well, safety is being able to get into the shallow water away from these big monsters and live a life that way. So Tiktaalik Rosie is a terrific example of a transition species. It's neither a fish nor is it a tetrapod. It's a fishapod, and that's where the name comes from. And it existed exactly where these three scientists predicted it would be. But think about how profound a statement that is. If evolution isn't real, there's no reason for Tiktaalik Rosie to have ever existed. If species were created specially, there's no reason for a now extinct transition species. You could just have fish and then have amphibians. But instead, you have Tiktaalik Rosie exactly where she's supposed to be. She existed 375 million years ago directly between two data points that we know exist, entirely aquatic fish species and entirely terrestrial amphibian species. And right in the middle, we have the fishapod, the perfect example of a transition species that provides even more profound evidence for evolutionary theory, not only because she exists, but because she existed when and where she existed in the first place. This is one of my favorite science stories because it, it's first off, it's a risky hypothesis. And it's an even riskier experimental approach. These scientists and their team went up to a very inhospitable part of the world because it was the only place in the world where they had the best chance of actually finding a species that would prove their already risky hypothesis that a transition species must have existed and there must be fossil evidence of one of these. And lo and behold, there's Tiktaalik Rosie right where it was supposed to be in the fossil record. Tiktaalik Rosie is one of the best and clearest examples of how the fossil record informs us about evolutionary theory, but also how evolutionary theory could be used for the purposes of deductive reasoning. But it's just one example. And there are countless examples out there of researchers who are using what we know about evolution to investigate the fossil record, to find new fossils, to identify new species. A lot of people have this idea that fossil hunting is sort of like treasure hunting. You just go dig a hole somewhere. That's not how it works at all. You know, you predict where you expect to find fossils based on the age of the rocks that you're investigating, what those rocks used to look like on the, based on the geology. You don't go looking for Tyrannosaurus rex in a Cretaceous ocean bed. It didn't exist there. T-Rex lived on land. You need to go find it in swamps or some other place. And time and time again, we see with the fossil record that the fossil record is entirely consistent. We find fossils when and where we're supposed to find them in no place else. J.B.S. Haldane was once famously quoted as being said this. He was asked at one point, what would it take for him to no longer believe in the theory of evolution? And he retorted, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. He was known as being a jokester. But what did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was, in order for him to stop believing in the theory of evolution, you would need to start finding fossils where evolution says they're not supposed to be. And to be abundantly clear, that's never happened. Never once. Out of all, we have fossils of 250,000 different species. And all of them are right where they're supposed to be in the fossil record. We've never found one out of the wrong date order. And while the fossil record provides us with perhaps the most wonderful examples of the evolution of species over time, I need to stress the fact that the fossil record actually isn't required for us to understand evolutionary theory. It's not required because we have so much other evidence in the form of homologous structures and analogous structures of convergent evolution. In genetics, in anatomy, in physiology, in development, we have so many different pieces of evidence that tell us how, where species came from, how they diversified, and how they're related, that the fossil record isn't actually needed. It's dispensable for the theory of evolution. And remember that when Darwin was establishing his theory of evolution, he had next to no fossils at his disposal. Now that we have fossil remains of 250,000, it just adds to the evidence in support of evolutionary theory. And the big thing to remember is this. While the fossil record isn't required, it's awesome. Why is the fossil record so near and dear to us? Because it's only in the fossil record that we actually have tangible evidence that we can see and feel and touch. Yes, there is irrefutable evidence 
in genetics, in molecular biology, in anatomy and physiology of the theory of evolution. But you can't put those things in a museum. You can't go and see a dinosaur that lived 130 million years ago in the form of his genes. But you can when you can reconstruct it, reconstruct it at a natural history museum. So while the fossil record is, is dispensable for the theory of evolution, it's indispensable for us because of what it teaches us and what we can see and observe in the fossil record. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot about fossils, how they form, and what they tell us about life on Earth. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you'll tune into my future videos, and I hope to talk to you again real soon. Thanks for coming. Bye.